Good afternoon. Uh, good morning to some, um, and it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce today's event. Uh, two friends of mine, uh, two incredible successful um, individuals who have stellar careers, but today one is in conversation with the other. Gives me great pleasure to introduce my dear best friend, Bill Rohde, in conversation with General David Petraeus. Bill, over to you. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, listen, welcome to everybody. And uh, I know everybody's, uh, we have multiple time zones. So, you know, good morning, good evening, <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, so fasten your seatbelt. This is gonna be really fast. Uh, geopolitically, we're gonna go around the world. And uh, I, I, I like just to start by saying, uh, well, first of all, happy Earth Day. Uh, and the world is observing Earth Day today. Um, and for those of you who have followed it, President Biden has promised 50% cut by 2030 in emissions. And he's hosting a conference with 40 world leaders, which um, interestingly also includes President Putin, supposedly, and also President Xi Jinping. So while the world is watching this very closely, uh, there's an ironic juxtaposition. And what is that juxtaposition? And that is that there's a buildup of uh, at least 120,000 some odd troops on the Ukraine border, Russian troops. Secondly, there was in the last few days, 20 Chinese bombers and fighter jets over the airspace of Taiwan. And then thirdly, uh, just last week, a nervous response to the announcement of the United States military leaving Afghanistan after 20 years. So the juxtaposition has struck me as it's all giving double meaning to the gathering storm. We're here to sort this all out with our dear friend, General David Petraeus. And I just want to add a bit to the intro that you've already seen, of course, the bio speaks for itself, but just a quote, if you will, by uh, the former U.S. Defense Secretary Robert Gates, who said about our dear General, history will regard you as one of our nation's greatest battle captains ever, ever. So he would join other West Point graduates, Ulysses S. Grant, John Pershing, and Dwight Eisenhower. He's airborne ranger all the way. He never says goodbye to me without saying rangers lead the way. He has been in every combat theater uh, in recent history, including Iraq, Afghanistan, of course. There's too many awards to mention, but he's a great American hero. And his acts of bravery and diplomacy and scholarship have given new meaning to thank you for your service. So with that, welcome General Petraeus. Great to be with you, Bill. And I just note that of course, well before I graduated from West Point, you did, uh, served with enormous distinction and courage on the battlefield, highly decorated as an airborne ranger uh, infantryman there, and then went on to do subsequent years in Europe. Uh, of course, you introduced MTV to the entire world, uh, for which we are all eternally grateful. And you've played an extraordinary role in various philanthropic endeavors, uh, having to do with a variety of uh, medical issues, not the least of which is how to help people combat the ongoing pandemic. So we thank you. You are a distinguished graduate of West Point, uh, as determined by the Association of Graduates, and that was an extraordinarily well-deserved. Well, thank, thank you for that. <laughs> I'm still apologizing for the MTV part, by the way, but thank you. <laughs> thank you for the comments. You, you should not at all. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's get right to it. Uh, General, with your uh, permission, I, I want to start with a brief look at your early years uh, because sure. uh, it's quite fascinating, actually. You're sort of an immigrant, if, if I'm not mistaken. You had a, uh, your father was a Dutch sea captain. Your mother was yep. a librarian from Brooklyn. So I just want to start... What was your childhood like? Um, it was, you know, we we're a solid middle class uh, community. Uh, my father did indeed come from the Netherlands. He was a graduate of their Merchant Marine Academy. He was at sea when the Nazis overran Holland. His ship couldn't go back to Rotterdam. They went into Brooklyn Navy Yard. They all signed on with the U.S. Merchant Marine, which was a military service during World War II and had the highest per capita loss rate. He obviously survived the war. Uh, Many of his comrades did not. 
that's why he, at the age of 29, he was the captain of a Liberty ship that did a run to Murmansk, which is really hazardous in those days. Again, made it, uh, then sailed on civil ships for a while and then settled down in the Hudson River Valley about 50 miles north of New York City in a lovely little town, uh, Cornwall on Hudson. Uh, of course, Henry Hudson went by and he said, that, what a lovely place to put a town on, and they did. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was a quintessential public school, great athletic programs, great uh, other activities, uh, in a variety of different ways and seven miles from West Point, literally grew up in the shadow of the mountain that overlooks West Point and also overlooks Cornwall on Hudson. Uh, and, you know, my father was a fairly stubborn Dutchman as all Dutchmen are. Uh, and I'd like to think I inherited that trait when it was necessary in some very tough times in Iraq and Afghanistan. But what he was basically about as many sort of crusty seafarers are as results. And um, if you came home and re reported something and, and gave an excuse as to why it wasn't perhaps as good as it might have been or as high as it might have been, he'd just sort of look at you and say, results boy. And there's a lot to that. And, um, and I think that was a pretty healthy uh, dose of reality at various key times. They both were great readers. They were both really quite significant intellectuals. Um, and, you know, they dragged me around to various cultural things during the summer that turned out to be really valuable over the years. I, you know, I would just want to hang out by the swimming pool and in my teen years, at least, and they'd drag me, you know, yet, yet again to the rude bridge that arched the flood at Concord or Lexington Common or the Old North Church or, you know, Edna St. Vincent Millay's birthplace, all these kinds of things that, uh, in the long run, turned out to be very, very broadening experiences for me and, and experiences for which I'm very grateful, although I wasn't always at the time. Well, you know, that brings me to my next question. When you mentioned your hometown, Cornwall and the Hudson, anybody at West Point knows that just right up the river, as you said, seven miles, I think it's five miles as the crow flies. And it breaks all records that I know of, of coming from the proximity so close to West Point. So the question is, why did you choose West Point? And I have to add a question. Did you think you're going to be home every weekend and you're going to hand over your dirty laundry to your mother? <laughs> no, I, I didn't know it was going to be quite as distant, far more distant than the seven miles, of course, once you're on that uh, base. But look, I think a lot of what we do in life is to be like those we admire. To be like Mike, as the saying goes. And I grew up admiring those who had graduated from West Point, uh, those who were serving at West Point, and those who were retired West Point graduates who coached my high school soccer team, taught in the high school that we had. Uh, over half of the newspaper customers that I had, I had a newspaper route every morning for two and a half years, great little discipline uh, development. And half of them were either West Point graduates or serving at West Point, and there was something pretty special about them. Uh, and candidly, your generation at that time actually was, was fighting a war, and a number of them came from our surrounding communities. Bill Carpenter was one of them, of course, the Distinguished Service Cross, uh, the Lonely End at West Point. So he was, a, he was a soldier, great soldier, a great athlete, a great leader, and there was something about that that I admired uh, greatly. And so that's where I went. Um, and, you know, it wasn't destined to be. And I must confess that at the two-year mark there, perhaps the way you did, I sort of wondered whether I really wanted to go all the way to the end and have the service obligation, especially after I spent a summer hitchhiking up and down the West Coast and going to Marina Del Rey every night in L.A. for a week on end. Um, but, you know, went back and got after it and then found in uniform something that was very special, which is uh, there's an aspect, obviously, of physical fitness. It's very, very important. It was always important to me. I was a college athlete uh, all three seasons of the year. There was something about the intellectual rigor that is there. Uh, and then there's obviously an enormous opportunity to lead at a very young age, uh, just as you led in your mid-20s, actually early 20s on the uh, in the battlefield, I think, uh, 130 or 40 soldiers, um, you know, I was privileged to lead. It took us a little longer by the time I got around. Promotions weren't quite as fast as they were in the Vietnam War era. But 
you know, extraordinary leadership privileges. And, uh, and that's the only way to describe, I think, the, the experience of leading America's sons and daughters in, in, in uniform. Well, you know, I think uh, you summed it up perfectly. The, the other thing about you know, your, your success, really, at West Point, the, your success came very early. I mean, you were a great brigade commander. You were uh, on the soccer and ski team. I just uh, realized recently that you had a scholarship to Colgate for uh, soccer. Uh, you were in the top 5% of your class, so you were a distinguished cadet. Uh, you even married, somehow, the superintendent's daughter. So uh, yeah, that was a blind date. I could claim no, no credit for that. She was as horrified that nobody knew me as I was to find out that it was the superintendent's daughter. But obviously, it, we hit it off. And uh, it was a source of endless ribbing, of course, for my classmates that, you know, you're dating the boss's daughter. We tried to keep it secret for a while, but that wasn't, wasn't quite possible. Well, you, you pulled off the impossible. You know, I, I will say quickly that uh, my social life at, at West Point, sometimes I say I... I left with less social skills than when I entered, and I didn't have a lot when I entered. And I had one blind date in four years, and she stood me up. So the good news is your blind date did not stand you up. So um, let's let's leave West Point and just uh, again on the personal side, look at your career, your 37 years in the military, and uh, can you identify perhaps one of your, or even your most challenging assignment. And I know whenever I come back and talk to cadets, they always ask me, was there any mistake you made, a military mistake, and, and, and how, did you res how did you respond to it? Well, I think, you know, the most challenging has to be the surge in Iraq because the country was in the verge of a full-blown Sunni-Shia civil war. Uh, and had the surge not worked, that country literally could have gone up in flames. You have to keep in mind that when the president made the decision to conduct a surge and selected me to be the commander and ambassador, Ryan Crocker, to be the new ambassador, there were 53 dead civilians due to violence every 24 hours just in Baghdad alone. That doesn't count military casualties, police casualties, all the other natural causes. This is people killed again violently in that city, which gives you a sense, again, of how out of control the situation was. Um, as I've often noted, the surge that mattered most wasn't the surge of forces. It wasn't the 25,000 extra Americans. As important as they were in implementing what we decided to do, the real surge was the surge of ideas. It was the change in strategy of 180 degrees from what we were doing. We had been handing off to Iraqi forces, moving back onto big bases preparatory to going home. And that strategy was invalidated probably eight months prior to that. It took a while to recognize it, but it was invalidated by an escalation of violence following the, the bombing of a sacred Shia shrine in a Sunni controlled area. Uh, and that country was in a death spiral really uh, when the surge began. Uh, I told Congress during the confirmation hearing that I had that it would get much worse before it got better. That proved to be true. It was very, very difficult. It was a grinding experience. This is where some of that Dutch determination or stubbornness or whatever uh, did come in handy. Uh, but ultimately, in the final two months of that first six-month period, which was critical because we knew we had to go back and testify at the end of six months, we saw a dramatic downturn in the level of violence. We'd already seen a dramatic downturn in the number of sensational attacks, car bombings and suicide uh, vest bombings. And therefore, Iraqi civilian deaths were way down as well. And after all, if you're supposed to secure the people as your number one mission, uh, that is the biggest metric out there. And then gradually, our casualties, Iraqi casualties, and all the rest started coming down as well as just overall attacks. That gave us a, a license for another six months because the, the support in the Senate, in particular in the U.S., uh, was really uh, on really waning very, very rapidly. There were only three really strong, staunch supporters, and they were the three amigos, Senator McCain, uh, Lin Lieberman, and Lindsey Graham. Uh, and otherwise, again, that could have literally been defunded, as was the war that you, were, uh, you fought eventually. Uh, and, and that retrieved it. And then the country had a whole new lease on life. We drove violence down by 85% over the course of the 18 months of the surge. It continued down further, which is the real metric as we drew down until tragically after we withdrew. And in fact, Sec 
Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin was the final commander there uh, during the part of my uh, CENTCOM time. And he, uh, right after he left, the prime minister tragically began the process of undoing what we had all achieved together, which was just very hard to watch. I watched it later as a director of the CIA. But that was, that was without a question, the most difficult. And you know, I'm sure that there were mistakes uh, that I made. There were certainly mistakes that we made as, uh, as an organization. Um, I remember one time where one of the soldiers decided to use pages of the Koran for target practice. We always had 25 meter ranges on every patrol base and combat outpost before you go out the wire. As you recall, you zero your weapon. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, and of course, those pages were found by a host nation worker uh, immediately went to the prime minister and I ended up apologizing uh, on camera to the prime minister of Iraq and President Bush apologized uh, publicly as well. So, but you know, when you have a setback, uh, when you, and that would be the more significant, I mean, the enemy dealt us blows that were just horrific. Uh, very, very serious casualties at various points in time. They they actually blew up the bridge, one of the br key bridges that connected West and East Baghdad. Uh, the old British, you know, it had been there since World War I, and here it ends up in the middle of the Tigris River. Uh, they hit that same sacred Shia shrine again. That was another crisis, uh, which we narrowly averted. All of those, and you know, all you can do is assess what happened, uh, try to understand how it happened, uh, what you need to do to mitigate the risks of that in the future and be very op honest, upfront, forthright about that. In fact, one of the early spokespeople that we had uh, was a two-star uh, army general, just couldn't get the bad news out front. We had a terrible day in Baghdad, 150 innocent civilians killed in three market bombings early on in the surge by suicide vest bombers. Uh, and, you know, you, we should have gone out and said, we had a horrible day in Baghdad today. Uh, instead went out and said, well, we have some good news for you, some bad news, and you know, starts talking about the new soccer league and the amusement park. And I said, you know, you gotta go out. This is what mattered. Don't put lipstick on a pig. We wanna be first with the truth. And that was what guided, that was the big idea, if you will, that guided our uh, information operations campaign or public relations campaign. Um, we constantly worked on getting the big ideas right. That was the key. That was the surge of ideas, communicating them effectively through the breadth and depth of the organization so that the soldier under body armor and Kevlar with a weapon understood my intent at my level and could turn it into a, a concrete action at his or her level, doing what only they could do outside the wire, which was engage the enemy and engage the population. You had to then oversee the implementation of the big ideas. That's the third task of a strategic leader. And then you had to formally sit down and determine how to refine the big ideas and do it again and again and again. And we actively followed that intellectual construct for strategic leadership. Uh, it, it was very, very helpful to us. And for what it's worth, we've captured that at the Belfer Center at Harvard, uh, where I was a fellow for six years uh, after leaving government. Uh, and it's it's a, there's a website there if you Google Petraeus on strategic leadership. Okay, good. Well, uh, let's stay with Afghanistan, uh, General, if we could. The uh, announcement last week has received so much coverage, and I, I'm sure you've followed the opinions. There's a lot of opinions that think it's a mistake uh, to withdraw the announcement being not May 1st, but on the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attack. Uh, September 11th, we will be withdrawing our troops. So, um, for example, William Haig here has uh, said it's a mistake. Uh, one of your colleagues, General McMaster, has said it's a mistake. There's others who think it's the right decision. Anyway. I, I, I have said it's a mistake. In fact, I didn't like the headline that announced that. It said, Petraeus trashes Biden's policy. Uh, but what I said, and I will repeat, was that I fear that we will look back two or three years from now uh, and regret having made this decision um, when we could, with a modest continued investment, uh, 3,500, 4,500 troops. I mean, compare that to the 100,000 Americans we had there in the 50,000 coalition when I was privileged to command in Afghanistan. Uh, that's a pretty sustainable level, and we haven't had a battle death in a year. 
again, I think that a superpower, along with its coalition, by the way, the coalition right now is twice as many troops on the ground as U.S. and yet showing essentially where the U.S. goes, they can go, and where we won't go uh, is pretty tough to go. They're all going to pull out uh, either prior to or alongside us. And I fear, again, that Afghanistan will see what happened a couple of years after the Soviet uh, withdrawal. Uh, the Taliban have gotten what they wanted so far at the negotiating table. They've given up nothing substantive. They've gotten their detainees out of, out of prison. There's some more they want, but they've gotten the bulk of them out. Uh, now they've gotten the U.S. to leave without e us getting anything whatsoever from them uh, of any sustainable or endurable value. Uh, and if they come back uh, in areas where they control, it is, has been proven yet again. In fact, we just uh, over the last year or so got a very significant al-Qaeda leader in an area controlled by the Taliban, keeping in mind that it was in an al-Qaeda sanctuary in Taliban controlled Afghanistan at the 9-11 attacks were planned and the initial training of the attackers was conducted. So again, I, am, I share the frustration of policymakers about the situation. Uh, our partners at times can be maddening, uh, infuriating, corrupt, whatever. But uh, again, uh, we are going to take an enormous risk and there is not yet any real plan for how we will keep forces in that general vicinity, noting that it's not just to keep the Al-Qaeda and now Islamic State elements from reestablishing a sanctuary. It's also to have a platform in that region to take action as is required uh, against Al-Qaeda and other extremist elements in that general vicinity, read Western Pakistan, keeping in mind that, of course, the operation that brought Osama bin Laden to justice in Islam, in, uh, Abbottabad, by the way, where their military academy is located, uh, that operation was launched from and recovered to Afghan soil, as were have, have been many other operations uh, that have used Afghan soil, because we have no other bases in that region. Uh, those that Pakistan would welcome us back, I, I told folks that will not happen, and indeed their prime minister has concurred, or has confirmed that he will not allow U.S. forces back on their soil. Uh, whether we can get a base in Uzbekistan remains to be seen. That's not a hop, skip, and a jump uh, from eastern and southern Afghanistan, though, and you got to go over the Hindu Kush to get to it. So, um, And that's the best that we're going to be able to do, and that's if they actually allow it, which they may or may not. Again, they, they welcomed us to leave Karshi Khanabad a couple of years into Afghanistan. Kyrgyzstan essentially got threw us out of Manas, Air base, which had to be then called Manas Transit Center, and now it's just it's not a base. And, and the Russians will have mixed mixed views about whether they want American forces in the former Russian republics of the Central Asian states. Well, that's a pretty dismal picture. Um, if it, if all that happens, and by the way, one as a side, I know you feel very close to the country, but uh, there's been a, a transformation over the past twenty years. Civil society um, it is enormous. Again, women can go to school. As I said, you know, I sure would not want to be that 50% of the population that wasn't able to go to school into the Taliban and now can. My wife and I sponsor, we give a scholarship every year uh, for a woman to go to the American University of Afghanistan. Uh, we know that they've been emailing back and forth recently saying we better study real hard this semester because there may not be another semester. Uh, no, it's pretty. It's a pretty grim. And of course, the Taliban have already been carrying out an assassination campaign against the educated, the elites, and so forth. That has scared some of them already out of the country. And I talked to somebody who's been in Afghanistan almost continuously for the last 20 years. The other day, very close to me, um, and he said, "You know, if there's any way out, people are looking for it right now." Uh, well, do you think President Ghani will survive? I know the Taliban doesn't support him. Well, it's going to be very, very difficult. We'll see. Uh, a lot of this, of course, you know, as I off, I note again when commenting publicly, and I perhaps should have here, we, there's just a lot we don't know. Uh, and I don't think our, our Department of Defense knows what is the level of commitment that we are going to provide to the Afghan National Security Forces in terms of, of dollars, uh, equipment, maintenance support. Are we going to still provide close air support? 
How about drone support? Noting that, I mean, it's a long flight from Qatar, uh, which is the nearest base if we don't get something in, in Uzbekistan. Uh, so all of these are very open questions. I think we'll park an aircraft carrier off southern Pakistan. Um, I, and I love the people that say, well, let's, should we just do it offshore? Well, Afghanistan doesn't even have a shore. It's a landlocked country, of course. Uh, and again, the spine of the country is defined by the Hindu Kush mountains. So that terrain is very substantial. We, we will park an aircraft carrier probably off the coast of Pakistan during the withdrawal of our forces, but we can't afford to have one sitting there just to provide an air base uh, to support the Afghan national security forces. But without our support, it's an open question as to how long they can survive. The, the very substantial special operations component is very, very good. In fact, our son helped. He was uh, over there with a Ranger Regiment uh, after having spent a tour there as an airborne rifle platoon leader, as you did uh, in Vietnam. He did over there with the 173rd Airborne Brigade when I was the commander, as a matter of fact. Well, uh, so that paints a pretty dismal picture with the Taliban, for sure. Uh, you know, particularly when it comes to women and girls. And I know there's been right. a, a lot of coverage on this. Do you think it also mm -hmm. opened the door for jihadist terrorism, Al-Qaeda and ISIS? Do you think it Yeah, again, again, there is a historic relationship between the Afghan Taliban, also what's called the Haqqani Taliban or the Haqqani Network, which is another offshoot of that. Uh, the Afghan Taliban comes out of Quetta, uh, in Baluchistan province of Pakistan. There's a reason I used to point out to our Pakistani partners is the reason they call it the Quetta Shura. It's located in your country, near Quetta. And we wish you would do something about it. And then the Haqqani network uh, comes out of the Western part of Pakistan, the very mountainous North Waziristan element of what used to be called the federally administered tribal areas, now Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. So, uh, and again, uh, they all have relationships with Al Qaeda uh, not as close with the Islamic State, but the Islamic State has an element there now called the Horasan group that straddles the Afghan-Pakistan border. There's various other elements as well. And so, yes, it's going to be, a, again, it very well could be the kind of civil war that we saw before because the northern uh, elements of the Afghan population uh, who are very different from the Pashtu, these are the Uzbek, Turkmen, uh, Kyrgyz, uh, and so forth, uh, they will probably withdraw into their own old sort of warlord-led units, uh, which were the ones that you may recall we supported in the early invasion of Afghanistan, used them as the ground forces to force the Taliban to mass and then clobber the Taliban with our B-52s and uh, close air support. Uh, so we'll see them return probably in an overt way, noting that the warlords have been there the whole time. Uh, they've just been acting in other capacities, including in some cases, provincial governors. Those are all very compelling uh, reasons why uh, this could be a big mistake generally. Of course, it's, in all fairness, it's appropriate to say that uh, I think the Biden administration was determined to the never ending wars, you know, that narrative, of course. And also the thought that maybe the ISIS and, you know, the original reason for going in has been dispersed, no longer there, getting soldiers out of well, let, me, let me talk about that quickly. I mean, number one, it is correct to note that there has been a dispersion, a metastasization of Al Qaeda elements and Islamic State affiliates. And so they're in Yemen, they're in East Africa, they're in West Africa, they're in uh, Northwest Africa, they're some out in the Philippines. And, and wherever they are, we actually have to keep an eye on them. Um, I think there's five lessons we should have learned, in fact, from the wars of the past 20 years with Islamist extremists. Number one is they will exploit ungoverned spaces in the Muslim world. Number two is you have to do something about it because what happens there doesn't stay there. It spews violence, extremism, uh, instability, and a tsunami of refugees into neighboring countries. And in some cases, as in the case of Syria, all the way into Western Europe. Number three is the U.S. has to lead because we have such a preponderance of, of military capability and the assets that really matter, the constellation of drones, precision air attack, and intelligence fusion. But we want a coalition and the coalition should include Muslim countries. Number four is that you can't actually counter 
terrorists with just counter terrorist forces. In other words, you just can't drone strike or Delta Force raid your way out of the problem. You can disrupt them that way, but that's not how you take back the ground that they control or, or eliminate them uh, by and large. Uh, you have to use a comprehensive approach. But we've figured out now how we can support host nation forces doing it. So they're doing the fighting on the front lines as the Iraqis and the Syrian de democratic forces did in eliminating the caliphate established by the Islamic State. And what we do is we provide the drones, we provide close air support, we provide intelligence, we provide advice and assistance, but we're not doing that fighting. And we also don't do the restoration of basic services, reconciliation, all the other tasks that are required. But number five is we have to recognize that this is a struggle that is at least generational in nature, if not longer. So it's not a decade or a couple of decades, much less a few years. You have to keep at it. So you have to have a sustained commitment, but you have to make sure it's sustainable in terms of the expenditure of blood and treasure. And that has transformed. Again, uh, we didn't have these capabilities when I was the commander of the surge in Iraq or the surge in Afghanistan. Um, so we can, we, there is a way that we can have a sustained, sustainable commitment now that wasn't possible before. And that's crucial because, of course, we really need to refocus our, our efforts and to, to, if you will, rebalance our forces to focus on the resurgent great power rivalries that are now the, the essence of the day uh, in the extraordinary rise of China, the resurgence of Russia, which, which by the way, newsflash, I believe, has announced that it is standing down those forces that were threatening Eastern Ukraine and Crimea. But I, we need to confirm that when this is done. So uh, that's the have taken. and clearly just withdrawing all forces from Afghanistan is ignoring those five lessons that I think are pretty compelling. Now, again, look, I understand you, somebody gets elected president by saying that we're going to end endless wars, but we have to recognize that we are not ending the endless war. We are ending U.S. involvement and because of that coalition involvement in an endless war, the endless war is actually going to get worse. It's going to continue, and you'll see a much more full-blown civil war in Afghanistan, likely. Again, perhaps not, and that would be wonderful. I would love to be proven wrong, and that three years from now, we look back and say, wow, what a wise decision that was, and how obtuse Petraeus and all those others were when they said that this would be unwise. Uh, but I fear that that is not going to be the case. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, I, I want to get to other countries in the world, but before we leave, do you think, because it's, it, there's a lot else going on in the region with Iraq and Syria, of course, not to go so vertical on that, but do you think the decision for Afghanistan impacts the situation in, in Iraq at all? Um, I, I don't know that it influences the situation in Iraq and Syria that much, as long as we maintain those, if we sustain that commitment, keeping in mind that the Iraqi government and we have had strategic negotiations that we need to draw that down further. They've got some dynamics of their own that uh, influence this. As long as we can maintain the capabilities there to help them against the remnants of the Islamic State that are insurgent elements now and terrorist cells that are still a plague in the country. And you can follow them. They're still in all the usual places where we fought them in the past. They're historic. They are the locations where you can hide and so forth. And there's sometimes some sympathetic Sunni Arab populations. The bigger influence may be to ask, look, if they can't sustain 3,500 troops in Afghanistan, um, do they really have the will for a long-term systemic competition with China? Um, I don't know that that is the case necessarily. I do know that the red line in Syria that was not a red line in the end did influence. It may have directly influenced Russia's sort of risk calculation when it went into the Donbass and uh, seized Crimea, and it may have also influenced somewhat the risk tolerance of the Chinese in the South China Sea. Um, that might be the bigger question. That is much more arguable, and I think that's something the president addressed in his speech, which is, again, that is very much arguable. What it, it's really all about Afghanistan and that particular region, keeping in mind that if this turns into a full-blown civil war, you're once again going to see millions 
of Afghans flowing into Pakistan, a country that is already beset by problems and has nuclear weapons and a lot of extremists. Right. Okay. Well, let, let, let's talking about South China Sea. Let's, and I also want to thank again Rich Hayden for coming up with those questions about uh, Afghanistan and the Middle East. Let's go to China. Everything has changed in the last 20 years, and it's accelerating. They're turning out to exceed all expectations and uh, being a very, very tough competitor. Probably the hottest flash point of all the issues facing China and the relations with the West is Taiwan. What are the chances of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? I think in the short term that, they, that, that is unlikely, uh, although you cannot, you can never discount the possibility of a miscalculation, a misperception, um, a miscommunication. So you've got to be work very hard to ensure that that does not happen. Uh, we obviously have to do a great deal of work to shore up the deterrence. Uh, and again, keep in mind that deterrence is a function of the adversary's perception of your will, and will matters here, and that's why there is some relationship to a decisions elsewhere in the world, but it's your will and your capabilities. Uh, and you have to make sure it's very clear to a would-be adversary uh, that you have each of those qualities uh, and that it would be a very, very costly endeavor uh, if a certain thing happened. Again, in this case, some kind of invasion of Taiwan. There's a variety of other scenarios involving that that could even be a bit more tricky, like taking one of the islands off Taiwan that's only 20 miles from the mainland and this kind of thing. Um, so this is where strategic engagement um, is crucially important. Um, and I should note that I think, by and large, this new U.S. administration is going about this in a very, very competent manner. Uh, by the way, I am truly nonpartisan. And so and I've criticized the previous administration. And, and obviously, there's this one issue in which I differ with this administration. But by and large, I think they are doing a very impressive job uh, domestically, by the way, as well as in, in foreign policy, but especially when it comes to China, which is the most important relationship in the world, not just to our two countries, but to all the countries of the rest of the world. If you think about the ramifications of the two leading economies of the world. Uh, and here you see the president engaging President Xi in a very serious manner. Uh, you see Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, engaging their counterparts. Yeah, there was some grandstanding and a lengthy filibuster by the Chinese diplomat uh, that was decidedly undiplomatic, but I have it on very good assurance from someone who was in the room subsequently that they then got down to business and had very, very, again, professional discussions. And then all the other stuff that's going on uh, around this, Secretary Kerry, of course, going out to Shanghai uh, to discuss the, the climate issues and, and seeing uh, now President Xi participate today Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The key here is that we have to have a coherent, that everything has to be working to the same end, comprehensive. You got to get every tool in the arsenal engaged, and not just government tools, but all the others as well. Whole of governments with an S on the end, so all of our allies and partners together to make way together to try to influence decision making in Beijing, which really means influencing President Xi. Because as of next summer, when they have the big party gathering to determine who the next president will be, since there are no term, term limits, he will not at, at 10 years. Uh, he will go along. So okay. our, our dog gets really worked up about this issue. She's very much into the U.S. China relations. Yeah, I, I hear the dog saying we should go on to the next subject. <laughs> but you know, just one little follow up here. Uh, you know, the, the ambu ambiguity of the military response. Yes, we've been uh, uh, supporting Taiwan, of course, in many different ways. But the, the question, and I know you just participated in a seminar with Admiral Stavridis on his new novel, uh, War by 1934. Um, 2034. 19, excuse me, 2034, yes, sorry. <laughs> but uh, just on this, will the United States respond militarily if all hell broke loose, do you think? Yeah, I think so, again, I think so. Uh, obviously I am not in government, so I can freely speak my mind and so forth, but yeah, look, I think um, 
we are not, I don't believe, going to change our uh, rhetorical policy, um, which does have a slight degree of ambiguity uh, in it, uh, and has ever since the very beginning of uh, really the Chinese state, and certainly from the beginning of our dialogue about uh, that led eventually to Deng Xiaoping to welcome the world to China, the reestablishment of US relations with China, peeling them off from Russia during the Cold War, very, very significant developments. Um, but again, we have always disagreed on the fundamentals involving Taiwan. Uh, you know, both Beijing and Taipei believe that they are the leader of China, that there is one China, the difference is that who, who actually should lead it. Um, and, you know, over the years, over the decades, uh, Taiwan has also been an extraordinary economic success. Um, you know, the best chip makers in the entire world, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. Um, and that is no mean feat, given the amount of capital that has to be invested uh, in the plants that produce those. They are ahead of the United States in that regard. Right. Um, right. But we will, I don't think we're going to do what say Richard Haas of the Council on Foreign Relations advocated, which is to say we have an Article 5 collective self-defense. That would be provocative, I think, actually overly unnecessarily provocative. But I think it is important to convey to China what could happen and what likely would happen without publicly sort of poking them in the eye uh, and basically challenging them without throwing down the gauntlet, which is what the, that, that would be the equivalent uh, if we were to have an alliance that had an Article 5 the way we have uh, with NATO, where an attack on one is an attack on all. Okay. Or with Japan, for, for example, which we reiterated and also noted the Senkaku for the purpose of that are dealt with as being part of that, the Senkaku Islands, the DIU to use the chi Chinese term. Okay, so we're coming to a close. We don't have too much time left, and I do have a rapid fire for you. But before that, let's just go to Russia, because I think you just said something would be big yep. news. But what was that all about? What was Putin trying to do with massing <clears throat> Ukraine? What was that about? Well, I suspect that there were domestic uh, political uh, issues here with Navalny, with the economy a bit flat at best. Um, you know, he's been helped a bit by the recovery of the price of crude oil, needless to say. But again, Russia's never had the resources since the price collapsed from, say, $105 per barrel Brent crude that it had back then. He's had to reduce some of the social spending. He's at the the lowest popularity, which is still, you know, any Western politician would love to have his popularity level, but that's not what he wants. And I suspect some of this is to take their eye off of a variety of other developments that are frustrating the population. And also, of course, the corruption and the kleptocracy and all the rest. And to show the rest of the world that he is still relevant, uh, which he has also sought to do by uh, going into Syria, active in Libya, not the, the invasion some years back of parts of Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and, and of course Crimea and the Donbass and threatening the Baltic states, et cetera. But I think he also realized at the end of the day, I, I think again, this current US administration together with our European partners, especially Chancellor Merkel who called Putin twice personally, but every level of the US government engaged counterparts in Russia, most of our European major partners, UK and others, all engaged their counterparts in Russia. And I think that persuaded them that this would be a really seriously stupid idea. And if you don't like the sanctions that you already have on you, just try this and see how your oligarch buddies like it when they can no longer travel to London uh, and use that beautiful townhouse that they bought there, you know, 10 years ago from their ill-gotten gains. So uh, again, I hopefully, and again, touch wood that that turns out to be a confirmed report. Um, but I think, again, this is about Putin striding the world stage uh, and showing that Russia still counts. Because let's keep, it's always important to remember what does Putin want? Um, he wants to reassemble as much of the former Soviet Union or Russian empire as is possible through various means. 
He hasn't been entirely successful in that, needless to say, but he has restored his country to a force with, a, with that others have to reckon, uh, and that's at least part of the way there. So uh, again, I think that's, you know, you often have domestic sources of foreign policy, and I think those were the factors that were probably most important in this case. And finally, there is another one that his worst nightmare would be a, an economically successful, vibrant Ukrainian democracy. Uh, because that would show his citizens what right looks like. Uh, and he has done whatever he can uh, in recent years uh, following the overthrow of his former uh, uh, Confederate there to ensure that they can't succeed. Okay. Okay. Listen, I'm going to uh, turn the rest of this into rapid fire, General. So pressure's on. We only got about eight minutes left. Um, JCPOA, will there be a new deal or not? Yes. Okay, good. Um, going back to Earth Day for a second. Whether it's a good deal, actually, I, you, I should, <laughs> a good deal would be to extend the, the end dates, the so-called so sunset clauses. I mean, a really good deal would be one that also encompassed the malign activity of Quds for supported Shia militia in Iraq, right. uh, Lebanon, Syria, and Yemen and did something about the very threatening missile program, I suspect we will not get that, even though the administration has said that's very important. But I do think we'll get back to the old deal, and then there will be an effort to try to, again, to extend those sunset clauses. Yeah. Because keep in mind, at the end of the day, the Trump card that always was played when I was in government and the Obama administration was working on this deal, is that, you know what, if they actually get close to weapons grade uranium or perhaps turn rich in that. The only alternative we have then is a military strike to take out their nuclear program. And there is nothing small about that, I can tell you, having been the commander of US Central Command when we put that together uh, and rehearsed it. Uh, and, and, and as you know, when you roll the iron dice, as Bismarck called the decision to go to war, you're never really sure what comes up. That's true. That's true. And then just on Russia, as we know, Putin has a high risk, has a high tolerance for, for risky things. So mm -hmm. uh, just quickly now, if you will, um, does China know where the origin of uh, COVID? Do, does China know the origin of COVID? It's a good question. Um, I don't know that anyone truly conclusively uh, has found that answer yet. I mean, I think most agree that, I don't know, 90, 95% that it came out of a, uh, you know, the so-called wet market, these uh, wild animals, again, that are sold uh, in markets and that have been the source repeatedly of previous viruses of this type. Um, I don't put much stock on the fact that it might have come out of the, uh, the, the laboratory there in Wuhan, but Again, it has not been disproven. So I think you're, the consensus of those in the know is that it's 90% at least that it came out of that wet market. Okay. So the U.S. Uh, just oh, if it jumped out of the laboratory, um, I think that eventually would have, leap, would have leaked even in that system, um, which is what gives me a little bit of confidence that the experts probably are right in their assessment. Okay. We got five minutes. In the US, 200 million doses have been administered in 100 days. Great story. In the UK, 33 million. Oh, 200 million people have been vaccinated. That's an even better story. Yes. Um, and, so, and also a good story in the UK. Here's the question fantastic uh, story. Each country has about two and a half times of, the ple uh, of pledges of their needs. When will those? excess doses be given to COVAX for distribution to lower income countries and fragile populations? I think it will be as soon as the U.S. has a sense that it is completely satisfying the remaining demand, which will have to recognize that there's going to be a subset of the population that will not agree to be vaccinated in the short term, but will have enough residual so that when they finally uh, see the light, if you will, uh, they will then uh, have that. So I, I think that's probably in the months that lie ahead. It's certainly not years. It's, it's probably 
month or two or three at most. Okay. And that's crucial because, as you know, this is a situation where no one of us is safe unless all of us are safe. And by the way, that's true to some degree economically as well, because beyond the worries of the pandemic, as a partner in a global investment firm, we're keenly aware that there are countries out there that have what are termed pre-existing economic conditions uh, before the pandemic-induced downturn hit. And there's a lot of concern about the potential debt crises that could be out there for certain fairly substantial countries. Okay, I got five questions left and only got two and a half minutes. <laughs> would Churchill be a state leader? Yes, to you can keep going. Would Church, which, yeah, David cracks a, the reason I'm wearing a tie is because of David. He cracks the whip on the time. Uh, World Chur uh, would Churchill be a state leader today or was World War II a unique moment in his time for history, for leadership? Well, I think he's a truly extraordinary strategic leader, but he is one who, in a sense, was lucky with timing. Um, in fact, Andrew Roberts, in his great biography, I believe it is titled Walking with Destiny. In other words, that he was destined for those times, but had those times not come along, um, we never would have realized how extraordinary his capabilities were for that particular moment. Right. So um, it's not just the people, it's also the situation and the opportunity. I mean, people say that I was lucky in the same way that he was lucky timing wise, you know, but for a few months in command of the 101st, I wouldn't have been there for the invasion of Iraq, which would have meant that I wouldn't be seen as somebody who sort of understood what we were doing and then gets the eye of Rumsfeld, does an assessment, comes back, gives him recommendations. He says, go back and, and implement these recommendations. You come back, you do the counterinsurgency field manual and it's, the place has fallen apart. So you go back and implement the ideas. So it is correct that timing is there, but I would also contend that in my case, and even more so in Churchill's, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Okay. He spent his entire okay. life preparing for that moment, walking with destiny, as Andrew Roberts put it in his marvelous yes. uh, bi yes. bi biography. And frankly, I spent my professional career preparing for what might happen, and it did. And so in a sense, that is lucky. Most admired military leader in your- U.S. Opinion. Grant. Most well, U.S. American would be U.S. Grant, I think. Okay. He, uh, uh, Ulysses admired. S. Grant, Ulysses S. Grant is the only U.S. Army general who was brilliant in combat at the tactical level, that sort of division level and below, the operational level for him, that was Vicksburg, one of the greatest maneuver battles and risky battles of all time and strategic when he designed the entire strategy that did save the union because with his strategy he ensured that lincoln was re-elected the prospects for which were very much in doubt until the victories by sherman in atlanta and sheridan in the valley ensured that lincoln would beat uh, mcclellan who had twice failed at grant's job of course uh, before grant but would have sued for peace so Grant truly was, as Hal Brands wrote, the man who saved the Union, uh, noting that Lincoln was a, the genius of all of this, but had it not been for Grant, Lincoln might not have had, might not have been reelected and you might not have had the outcome that we did. And, and if you don't know, you hosted a great show about uh, Ulysses S. Grant on the History Channel, three-parter. Who, who will be the next country to land on the moon 50 years after we did? After U.S., will it be U.S., Russia, China, or UAE? Um, I think it may be the U.S. We'll see it. I mean, China's got a legitimate shot at it, but of course, we've been preoccupied with flying helicopters on Mars, so that's a pretty good excuse. So I'm going to go to my most important question. I'm going to skip the rest because I know David's going to cut me off any minute. So it's a personal request from my daughter, teenage daughter. And uh, I, I promised her because she knows you're the former CIA director. Um, and she wants me to ask you, are there any alien spacecraft or even alien bodies being kept in Area 51? And we promise to keep it a secret if you tell us the truth. Absolutely. 
<laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> it's all nonsense. Um, but, but it's fun nonsense. And, uh, you know, and we play along with that very much. And I mean, look, there are un, unexplained phenomena that do give rise to this. And those, I, I, one of my correspondents is so deeply into this that, uh, and they're, they cling to all of this. And of course, Area 51 is the place where it's all sequestered, but uh, actually not really. Okay, well, she'll be, disappointed. she'll be disappointed with that answer, but anyway. I'm sure she I'm, will. I'm going to turn um, it over to David. Let me, let me thank you, Ranger Rody, again for this. It was really, really a pleasure to do this with you and, and actually to do a number of things with you over the years and to admire your work now, even after uh, your professional career, if you will, as I said, in the philanthropic arena. That is very, very substantial. Uh, and David, thanks so much for allowing two good old Airborne Rangers to get together on your virtual stage. And, and thanks for your support of a number of causes uh, that are near and dear to all of us over the years as well. Thank you, General. Thank you. Thank you, Bill Rohde, a phenomenal hour spent together. Happy Earth Day. Look forward to connecting with both of you again very soon. Good evening.